Matthew chapter 27, Matthew the 27th chapter, starting verse 45. Matthew 27, verse 45. We started a few weeks ago on the, his words, his last words, the last words that he would say at the cross. And, and as we moved through them last week, we took a little break with Mother's Day. Today we move into one I think is uh, extremely sensitive. We know that when he first went on the cross, and I love the songs we sing to remind us. It, it seemed like the name Jesus is such an offense to people to say it. We can say God, we can say Father, we can say man upstairs. But boy, when you say Jesus, all of a sudden it ignites something. And, and I can't back away from that. He's Emmanuel. He's God with us. Amen. He's the God man. In this passage, oh, we're going to find out he was the God forsaken man. It's, it's, a, it's one of those unique passages that you see. You don't, you're not expecting it. You don't expect this from the cross. Yes, perhaps you would expect. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Perhaps you would understand, today you'll be with me in paradise as he reaches out to another one. Perhaps you'd even hear him say to, to uh, John as he looks down at his mother and says, Woman, behold thy son. Son, behold thy mother. Three hours has passed. Now we're going into the sixth hour. For three hours, from 12 to about 3 o'clock, there was almost nothing going on except darkness began to cover over the place. And then almost simultaneously, we have his three, uh, four last sayings that he shares from the cross. And the scripture says in Matthew 27, are you comfortable? This week I was involved with uh, Brenda Johnson's dad. Uh, Ed Keeling had passed. Some of you knew Brother Ed, great man of God, worked with Teen Challenge, just just a, a great guy. Uh, and a man came up to me and reminded me. He said, Pastor, we used to do three Sunday morning services. And I was thinking, you know, there are times in my mind I don't want to go back to that. Uh, you know, I just, I, I just think about it. I love the excitement of all of it, but I also think back of what life was. Uh, I'm, I've kind of jumped on a a rabbit right there, but me and Pastor Mike was both talking about it. There comes a time in your life you hit a certain season, you just thank, thank God for the season you're in. And that's where I'm at. I just thank God for the season I'm in, for the seasons I've been, and for the seasons I'm heading into. Amen. Jesus on the cross, as he moves into that, that, that sixth hour, that final time, the Scripture says in Matthew 27, verse 45, from the sixth hour to the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Again, I can hear, Father, forgive them. Again, I can hear, you'll be with me in paradise. Again, I can hear, take care of my mom. But my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Begins to pierce the air. That changes everything. It, it, it literally breaks the silence, and it brings forth some thinking for us to do right now. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, God, for the excitement in this house. I pray, God, for an elevation of this house, Lord, in this community that people would reach out and, and find you here in Jesus' name. And everyone shout, amen. amen. God bless you. You may be seated. I've called this the bottom of the cup. You've heard me talk about the cup before. Being raised up in North Alabama, we had coffee that come out of a, a, um, a percolator. And when they finished perking, you went and got coffee. But if you were the last cup, you often got some grounds in your cup. And if you didn't notice it, you'd take sips right off and you'd forget. All of a sudden, you'd hit that bottom of the cup and it'd be full of dregs. I don't know what dregs. I never Googled dregs. I just know it was called the dregs. It was the end of the coffee. And it always had this bitter taste to it. And this is what I see with Christ, that there were three parts of that cup. The, the, the physical, of course, the, the, uh, the mental, but the spiritual part, here's the bottom. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I look at the scripture and I realize God made him sin. Uh, he put the sin. Of course, we understand this, uh, the, the blood, the sins were on the lambs, and they would sacrifice the lambs and the goats and the pigeons, amen, to roll sins forward. But now, once and for all, the sin will be abolished. It will be wiped out. Some may ask, uh, when Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken us? I've heard people say to me, Pastor, I feel like God has forsaken me. I feel like God has left me. When I look over the just on 2019 uh, in Sri Lanka during Easter, there was a series of explosions that were reported at three churches, at three different places, three hotels and several, several cities there. 253 people, including dozens of foreign nationals, were killed and more than 500 were injured. 
those bombings occurred during Easter Mass. Uh, when I read about this, I think about also what about the fires that took place in California that took out the whole town of Paradise. Eighty-five people were killed. I'm telling you, there, it, this, this weekend, storms blew across the Oklahoma and Texas. People died in tornadoes. And you have to ask yourself, God, have you forsaken us? The answer is very, very important for you to understand. No, he's not forsaken us. He only forsook one man in all of history for one time so that he could always be with us through whatever else we went through. And not many miles away now sits a middle-aged man with his head in his hands. You can imagine for yourself, I've, I've, I've witnessed this as a pastor, even in my own life. He may start the day off going to work, doing his job. Then the boss calls in, says, Charlie, I've got bad news for you. Not you, Charlie, but we're just in my story here. I've got bad news. Just like that, after our 16 years and four months and three days, uh, he's been fired. Now he's left with a family, a big mortgage, two kids who need braces, no job. In anger, he cries out, God, why have you forsaken me? So here's the God-man on the cross. The men come out to Golgotha to kill and heal, if you would. On this day, more people than usual have gathered. They come out of the macabre human fascination with the bizarre, the very horror of crucifixion seems to draw people. This day seems like any other, but it's not. A man named Jesus is being crucified the word spread like wildfire. His reputation has preceded him. He's done nothing wrong. Nobody is neutral here. Some believe, many doubt, a few hate. Three hours of darkness. The scripture says that noon darkness fell upon the land. It happened so suddenly that no one expected it. One moment the sun was bright and right overhead. The next moment it disappeared. And I will say this probably next week. When Jesus said, I I'm thirsty, the clouds gathered around him. He had to be careful what he said. If he had mentioned angels, come get me, the angels would have came and got him. He had to be, when he said, I thirst, they, the clouds gathered around wanting to give him a drink. It lasted for those three long hours. And then after he, his death, it suddenly, as the darkness had descended, it disappeared. What in God's name was going on? Mortally wounded. Suddenly he screams only four words, but they come out in a guttural roar. Eli, Eli, Elamach, His words in Aramaic, the common language. He didn't speak some language nobody else understood. It was common. I like common language. I like when people say to me, Pastor, I like listening to you because I can understand you. When I say fit and you understand it. When I say get her done, you, don't, you understand what I'm saying to you. There was a common language came forth from the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? His last say is the words we can understand. But what do they mean? The story is told that the great Martin Luther was studying this text one day. This is the man that beat the 99 thesis on the uh, Wittenberg door in Germany that the just shall live by faith. He started a, a revolution of the Protestant movement, uh, of moving away from, from uh, uh, churches that were were led by, by priests and corrupt, and he just began to start some. They actually put a death warrant out on him. They tried to kill the man and take him out. And this man, he, he stood for hours and days. He stared at this text, and he said nothing. He wrote nothing but solidly pondered these words, what Jesus said, that, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Suddenly he stood up and he yelled, God forsaken by God? How can it be? How can God be forsaken by God? How can the Father forsake his own son? When you understand this, in this black moment on the cross, God the Father turned his back on God the Son. The word forsaken is very strong. It means to abandon, to desert, to disown, to turn away from, to utterly forsake. You've got to understand, why have you forsaken me? It was not simply because he felt forsaken. He said it because he was forsaken. At that moment, and it's, uh, if you're a parent in any love in your heart at all, the hardest thing you will ever do is turn your back on a child. One that you've loved, even if you have to deal with. Here's a sinless man who has done no wrong. His father said, in whom I'm well pleased when he was baptized, and yet at this moment he's turned away from him. Many of us, we know our kids aren't sinless. We know that we weren't sinless. We know that we've done wrong. And yet at this moment, when our kids have done wrong, we have turned toward them. We've bailed them out. We've loved them. We've protected them. We've defended them. Even when they were wrong, I don't care as my kid. I know you rednecks. I know how you are. Amen. We'll do it, and we'll do it every time. And yet at this moment, God the Father turns his back on his son. And begins to forsake him. Literally, truly, and actually, God abandoned his own son. In English, the phrase is God forsaken. Usually refers to a place unfit for human habitation. But we do not literally mean God forsaken. Hell will be a God forsaken place. 
At this moment, literally, it's like hell was put on Christ. He understood all the sins of the world being put on him. He was the first and only God-forsaken person in all history. It's not going to happen again. A father's chief duty, and we understand this, when Jesus, he addressed him as my God. Everywhere else, he's called him Father. But here he said, my God, because the father-son relationship had been broken, but only for a moment. It is the chief duty of every parent to take care of their children, to do their best to ensure that our children do not suffer needlessly. Will we not do anything we can do to stop it from happening? Many of us have gone overboard to the extent of maybe even hurting our kids because we bailed them out so many times in time and eternity. What brings us to this great question? Why would God do such a thing? One observation will help us find an answer. Something must have happened that day that caused a fundamental change in the father's relationship with the son. Something must have happened. At that precise moment, Jesus was bearing the sin of the world. During those three hours of blackness, Jesus felt the full weight of the sin. This is what he knew when he said, Father, let this cup pass from me, but nevertheless, not as I will, but as whatever you decide to be done, let it be done. He knew this was coming. The Bible teaches that Jesus was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, but the slaying itself didn't happen. If I told you that that one day this is going to happen, that's one thing. But when that day finally gets here, you know, this funeral that I was involved in, Mr. Ed, Ten years, again, this man taught kids that had been on, on, on addictions uh, through Teen Challenge. Some, men, some of those men were there to witness his life. I'm speaking of Brenda Johnson's dad. And, and Ed gets close to the end of his life. He had surgery ten years ago. They told him, this surgery will probably give you ten more years to live. He knew that he had probably 10 more years to live. He gardened. He loved Sister Jean. He took care of family. He, he took care of Brenda. He just kept loving through life, building churches, doing the things he did. But right here at the end, he knew his 10 years were up. He knew that in the beginning, they said, you got 10 years. They gave him a time. On Saturday, he goes to the hospital. He looks at Brenda and the family. He says, in three days, I'll be home. In three days, God will take me from this body. In three days, I'll be dead. Tuesday, he passed away. He planned his time out. He knew it was happening. But, you know, to be ready for that, to be ready to die well, to understand this moment was something. To be slain from the beginning was one thing. But now it's going to happen. Here at A.D. 33, the death of Christ was a historical event in every sense of the word. Amen. But it's history, historical with eternal implications. The disjointed trinity. What would cause a father to forsake his own son. The book of Habakkuk, chapter 1, verse 12, tells us, O Lord, are you not from everlasting? My God, my Holy One, we will not die, O Lord. You have appointed them to execute judgment. O Rock, you've ordained them to punish. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrong. Why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? God's holiness demands that he turns away from sin. God will have no part of it. When God looked down and saw his son bearing the sin of the world, he didn't see his son. Instead, he saw the sin that he was bearing. And in that awful moment, the father turned away. Now, when I was a kid, we couldn't afford Christmas tree lights. But we could afford an aluminum Christmas tree. And that aluminum Christmas tree in front of it had these three colors of red, yellow, and blue on a rotating. Uh, Y'all follow me? So when you saw the tree, you didn't see an aluminum tree. You saw a green tree, a red tree, and a yellow tree, and a green, red, yellow, green, red, yellow. That's what you saw. When God looked down on us, he doesn't, and, and listen, it's not a permission to do whatever you want, but God doesn't see you as aluminum anymore. He sees you through the blood of his son. And when he sees you through the blood of his son, that shows that he's not looking at the sin. He knows that we've done wrong. Can't hide that. Amen. You can't hide anything from him. But he's not going to look on it. And that's why the blood was so important. Not in anger at his son. No. He loved his son as much at that moment as he ever had. He turned away in anger over all the sin, the world that sent his son to the cross. He turned away in sorrow and deepest pain when he saw what sin had done. He turned away in complete revulsion at this ugliness of sin. When he did that, Jesus was alone, completely forsaken. God forsaken, abandoned, deserted, disowned. It's true. When Jesus bore the 
sins of the world, mine and yours. He bore them all alone. Christ is now abandoned. The Trinity is disjointed. The Godhead is broken. He became sin for us. And I truly don't believe we understand the horror. To say this is to say nothing more than what the Word of God says. In 2 Corinthians 5, 21, God made him Jesus who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He sees us through the blood. Think of it. The sinless one was made sin for us. When God looked down that day, he saw not his sinless son, but sin itself. Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. When Jesus was baptized, the voice from heaven said, this is my boy. I'm pleased with him. No longer will this voice say that at the cross. The beloved son became a curse for us. Isaiah 53.6, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us, we turned our own way, did our own thing. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. We did that. We did that. We put that sin on him. It was our what we had done. He took it for us. Amen. Jesus became a curse for us. He died in our place and for all our sins. That's why I'm grateful this morning. Amen. That's why I, I said that's why I'm grateful this morning. That's why I'm happy this morning. Amen. I didn't have no choice without him. I couldn't do this without him. He did that. And not only did he do it, he emptied the sewer. He emptied out the, they ain't, you know, what am I, David, one of my fondest pictures of you is you coming up out of a sewer there at the ranch. I don't know who snapped that picture, but you were the only one small enough at that time. Uh, you, you were a little too pudgy to go down in the hole, I know. You've lost weight since then. But David, he went down in there, and he, he'd been getting to clean it out. And I looked at him, and I said, now, that's a man that'll do whatever God calls him to do right there. He do, listen, Isaiah 53, 10 says, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He, had put in, he, had, he put him to grief. When thou shalt make your soul an offering for sin, be sin for us, become a curse for us, laid on him the iniquity of us all. Imagine, my friend, that somewhere in the universe there is a cesspool containing all the sins that have ever been committed. The cesspool is deep, dark, and indescribably foul. All the evil deeds that men and women have ever done are floating there. Imagine that a river of filth constantly flows into that cesspool, making it larger and larger, replenishing the vile mixture with all the evil done every day. Day. Imagine that while Jesus was on the cross, that cesspool was emptied onto him. Set the flow of filth as it settles upon him. The flow never seems to stop for three hours. It is vile. It is toxic. It's deadly. It's filled with disease, pain, and suffering. Nobody else could see it, but you could see it uh, but, but himself. When God looked down at his son, he saw the cesspool of sin emptied on his head. No wonder he turned away from the sight of every toxic, deadly, filled with disease, pain and suffering poured upon him that's why the scripture says he took on his body he meant all the pain that he went through was for our healing our mental spiritual and physical well-being Amen. To learn to accept that and receive that. Think of it. All the lust in the world was there. All the broken promises were there. All the murder, the killing, the hatred between people. All the theft was there. The adultery, the drunkenness, the bitterness, the greed, the gluttony, all the drug abuse, all the crime, all the cursing, every foul deed. Amen. Every wicked thought, every vain imagination. All of it was laid upon Jesus as he hung on the cross. That's why he said, my God, my God, where did you go? God turns for those few moments. What's that, 60, 80, 100, 120, 180 minutes poured upon him? Two great implications here as I begin to close. First, we must never minimize the horror of human sin. Sometimes we laugh at sin and say, you know the devil made me do it. I remember, you don't remember Flip Wilson. I remember Flip Wilson. The devil made me do it. Amen. As if, if sin were something to joke about. But it was our sin, our missing the mark that Jesus bore that day. It was our sin that caused the Father to turn away from the Son. It was our sin floating in that cesspool of iniquity. He became a curse. And I know many of you say, well, Pastor, I wasn't even around then. You don't think you've sinned since you've been born. You don't think you've hurt people, done wrong since you've been born. Amen. All that is, gets to be put back onto the cross. It was our sin floating there. Let us never joke about it. Amen. First, second, we must never minimize the high cost of our salvation. And this is what excites me. It, is, is it possible that some believers become tired of hearing about the cross? Is it possible that we would rather hear about happy things? Happy, happy, happy. Amen. Without the awful pain of the cross, there would be no happy things. 
Without the cross, there ain't no happy things. There's nothing to be happy about. We would be lost forever. No salvation, no forgiveness. Without the cross, our sins would still be upon us. It cost Christ everything to redeem us. Where was God then? This cry from the cross is for all the lonely people of the world. It is for the abandoned child, the widow, the divorcee struggling to make ends meet, the mother standing over the bed of her suffering daughter, the father out at work, the parents left alone, the prisoner in his cell, the aged who languish in convalescent homes, singles who celebrate their birthdays alone. Mm -hmm. This is the word from the cross for you. No one has ever been alone as Jesus was. You will never be forsaken as he was. No cry of your pain can exceed the cry of his pain. When God turned his back and looked the other way, he was forsaken that we would never be forsaken. He was abandoned, that we would never be abandoned. He was deserted, that we'll never be deserted. He was forgotten, that we may never be forgotten. You know, the wonderful thing about the cross to me is that we ain't got to go to hell. Amen. That's how wonderful the salvation is. You know, listen, if you go to hell, it would be in spite of what Jesus did for you. And I will say to every American, we are without excuse. We have lots of gospel. We've heard it. Amen. All we have to, as a matter of fact, we need to be preaching what we've heard. We need to take it out. God forsook, was forsaken one time. Amen. He forsook his son one time that we may never be forsaken again. He's already been there. He took the blow. He took the pain. He endured the suffering. He took the weight of all our sins. So if people want to go to hell, don't blame Jesus. Don't blame him. It's not his fault. He went to hell for you. So you won't have to go to hell. Amen. What's the worst thing about hell, Pastor? My friend, it's not going to be the fire, though it's real. It's not the memory of your past, though it's real. It's not the darkness. The worst thing about hell is that it's the one place in the universe where people are utterly and forever forsaken by God. Hell is truly a God-forsaken place. That's the hell of hell. Be in one place where God has abandoned you for eternity. Whew. It's sobering to me. The cross is sobering. Everything about this thing affects me. Amen. My God, my God, why did you leave me? I left you so that I'll never have to leave him or Susan again. I'll never have to leave you, sir. I'm always going to be there for you. Amen. I walk through this, and I hear myself preach, and I say, Jerry, you don't have to be in the pain. You don't have to let your mind struggle like that. You understand this he took it for you and all of a sudden H when I realized he took it for me it's it's not that I'm healed I want to be healed my want to be sometimes what we lost was our want to be we don't want to be we just want to suffer I don't want to suffer I want to be healed I want to be delivered amen I want to have freedom in my life I want it that's what he did to me I want it I want it no matter how many times I read Hebrews 13, 5, it still blesses me. Don't be obsessed with getting more material things. Be relaxed with what you have. Since God assured us, I'll never leave you. I'll never leave you down. I'll never walk off and, I, and leave you. I won't do it. We can bear, boldly quote, God is there, ready to help. I'm fearless no matter what. Who or what can get to me? That's out of the Message Bible. We can boldly quote. God is there. You know what it says in the King James, that, that I may boldly say that uh, uh, he'll never leave me nor forsake me. Never, never, never leave me. I'm fearless no matter what. Who or what can get to me? I think we've got to turn the, the fearless loose in us, yeah. the excitement loose. Dad, Mom, you got to turn that fearless. You're going to Utah. Woo! It's got four, four seasons. Woo! Mountains. You got to turn the fearless loose in your life. Amen. I see, I see good days ahead, excitement ahead. I, I know where you've been living, but now I'm going to tell you Dayton's a nice place, but wait till you get to Utah. Woo! Fearless. Sometimes you've got to approach life with a little more fearlessness. Heads bowed, eyes closed just for a moment as you're sitting there. Let me pray for you. And let me just mention to you again. You do not, after hearing my voice, want to walk away, whether you watch it online or anywhere else. Understand that God was forsaken 
so that you'll never have to be forsaken. And your head's about it so that only God can see your hand as you lift it. But if you say, Pastor, I, I know I've been away from God. I want to accept his blood and forgiveness right now. In fact, you put your hand up and back down real quick. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Amen. Three, four hands, five hands. Amen. Let's pray this together. Lord Jesus, I accept that if I ask you to forgive my sins, you will cleanse me with the blood from a cross over 2,000 years ago. And then when God looks at me, he'll see righteousness. Not that I have done, but what you did. I receive it. I accept it. I will live for you the rest of my life in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I love when somebody says to me, Pastor, I, I want to do things. I want to do things as I'm getting older. Amen. He said right there, Sam. David, if you grab my Bible. I want to do things as I get older. And uh, Sam, Sam has this tremendous opportunity to preach his grandson's wedding. Now, in order to do that officially, put his signature on there, I got to license him. My authority invested in me as a minister of the great state of Texas and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Give him a sober thought here. Now, I need my glasses. Joseph, come up here. Stand behind. Sam, if you would. Sam, I want you to hear this. And you, you're, in the, you're in Vietnam. You're in the military. Paul said to Timothy, his son, he wrote him a second letter. When you get a second letter, it means you didn't catch the first letter. <laughs> he said, and then my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Give me a hand, sir. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, Sam. I entrust to reliable men like yourself who will also be qualified to teach others. Sam, endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. And that's what you want to do, sir. You want to please your commanding officer, Christ Jesus. Amen. So on this day, we license you. We pray over you. We anoint you. We thank you, God, in the name of Jesus for Sam Griffin's life. I remember when I first met him. God, I did not see this coming. Lord, I, neither did he. But, God, you softened this, this big man's heart. You touched him and you turned him around. You made him a, a pillar in the house. That's literally what he is here. He's a pillar in this sanctuary. God, to be a blessing to others. He holds a roof up for us. He prays over us. And God, I ask that during this wedding and all other weddings and funerals he may do in his life, God, that you be with him. You give him the words and the anointing. And God, let him speak outside himself. God, as the man of God that he is, that he, is, that he endures hardship as a good soldier. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. You made it official, Sam. If I get our servant leaders to come up. I forget something? Forget it all? Is that right? Amen. What an honor for me to get to do that for you, sir. I've loved you a long time. Amen. Uh, don't, don't take for granted this house. Amen. What I mean by that is be a tither, be a giver. Understand how important that is, particularly as we move into our summertime. Amen. So if you need a tither, offer an envelope, lift your hand. If you're online, if you're giving by your phone, just wave your phone at them as they come by. 
Amen. You can go to holywildministries.com. There's a place to give there. You can give on our app if you've not downloaded it. I think there's even an iPad back there somewhere, if I remember correctly. Uh, but we thank you for all the things you've got there to uh, the, the, all the opportunities to give. Now, look, when I'm looking at this, listen, I see a ladies' Bible study. I see, Miss Diane, you have ladies' Bible study. I see seniors with a purpose having twice a month Bible studies. Once a month Bible studies. Amen. I, I, we have a clothing ministry right now that's in Bas, Bastrop. A whole group of ladies that are meeting. Probably watching me right now. If you are ladies, I love you. Amen. They, 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 are, they, they get together and they, they're a ministry. We have our youth ministries that get together and do things. As the summer goes on, they'll be doing things. I've talked with our, our, our advisors. I've talked with my pastor and others. We're going to do something that we've, not, uh, we've never done. But we feel like we need to reset some things in this house. We're going to be suspending our midweek services starting in June. And we're going to do that throughout the summer. And then we're going to start back up after the summer. So what I'm saying is, and, and, uh, is that we want to make sure our Sundays are strong and that you have places to get fed, that you're involved in other meetings that are going on in this church. There's, and there's, I, I mentioned some. I didn't get to mention them all. We got you six. There's another meeting that goes on for vets. But we want to suspend the midweeks, Tuesday and Wednesday. And, and then, of course, many of you know that we've got about 2,000 kids coming to youth camp this summer. So there'll be opportunities to gather with you. And then I'm hoping to have some men's meetings over here during the summer and to gather with you. So we don't want, we're not, we're going to have strong Sundays. We're starting June, the first week of June. Amen. We'll be suspending those, those meetings. Don't, don't look too sad, particularly if you ain't been here. All right. For those that have been, you know, I, I'm telling you, I appreciate your faithfulness. It doesn't mean the end of anything. We're just suspended for a while to get through the summer. A lot of folk are on vacation. Another thing is I see a fatigue among our children's ministries. Amen. We, we want to make sure they get rejuvenated. Amen. So it's not, a, it's not the end of anything. It's just something else we're going to try. So uh, uh, bear with us and be here on Sundays particularly. David. Amen. So again, the the ministries that we have outside of our gathering times is important to get connected to, to get connected with other people. Fellowship. It's it's by our fellowship that we strengthen one another, that we sharpen one another. You can't sharpen something unless you rub it against something else. And and so in order for you to get sharpened, you can't do that by yourself. A knife never sharpened itself ever in the history of ever. So you, it's important that we get by other people. Sometimes people rub you wrong, <laughs> just like <laughs> when you sharpen a knife. And that's okay. That's part of life. It's important to get next to our, our brothers and sisters in, in our small meetings. Um, special Memorial Day service, Monday Memorial Day. Pastor will be speaking at Sterling White service, 10 a.m. Um, we do have a picnic today right after second service. There'll be games, watermelon, uh, bring your own lunch. Uh, June 2nd, clothing ministry will be open. June 3rd, we got your 6th. Uh, June 4th, Camp Holy Wild ropes course and cafeteria meeting starting up summer camps. So uh, volunteer. Again, here's just another opportunity uh, to, to fellowship with your brothers and sisters, to get acquainted, to get to know. Uh, a lot of times people are like, man, I, 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 I don't know you guys that well. There's plenty of opportunity. You want to get to know any of us? Yeah. We out at the camp. Right. Come show up. That's it. We're there. I promise all the time. <laughs> We're always there. So I live there. Can't, can't shake it. So uh, just come, hang out. Wherever, wherever you fit, fit. Amen. Today we're believing God for jobs and better jobs. More money, less hours. Benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts demolished, royalties received, favor, success to the kingdom. Take it away, Joe. <laughs> 